Our next session is First Aid is Too Late, Rethinking Our Collective Power in Early Intervention. And now, Dr. Anu Partap. Hi, everyone. It is so wonderful to be here, sort of, right? I really wish I was in the same room with you all. Uh, I do feel like having participated in the last session, we had some kind of connection because I got to see how many of you have joined today. And our last speakers were fabulous. And I'm still really thinking about the things that I learned from them. And I hope what I'm going to talk about continues to expand on or build on what they've said. And uh, maybe I can change some of what I said based on what I learned from them as well. So uh, if you want to go ahead and pull up the slides for me. Okay. Okay, your slides are up. All right, thank you. So our objectives for today are to identify opportunities for providers to recognize when children and caregivers are living with health inequities, to discuss tips for tackling unspoken walls between families and providers in order to support access to early intervention. So I have spoken at Congress before, and I really want to extend uh, my admiration for the fact that the board and Kathy have been able to figure out a way to creatively connect all of us during this really tough time of isolation and not be able to connect with each other as easily. Uh, since I last spoke to you all, I've actually done something pretty uh, nerve wracking, which is I left the exam room. So I have not been a practicing pediatrician in its purest terms for two years. Uh, leaving the safety of an exam room to go out into the community and really hear from families, community leaders, elected officials, and really dive into what's working and what isn't has been eye-opening and, as you heard earlier, humbling uh, and has really changed the way I think about public health, our role in pediatrics, and how all of us support or unintentionally don't support our families who are just doing what they were wanting to do, which is raise uh, healthy, happy children. So all of those concepts are sort of spread out throughout our 30 minutes together. It begins with this, which is a definition of health equity. I'm going to show you two, but it's really a public health term. And this one is from the WHO, and it says, ideally, everyone should have a fair opportunity to attain their full health potential, and no one should be disadvantaged from achieving this potential. There's a lot more to it, and that's already a little bit heavy, right? So I like what Robert Wood Johnson Foundation did, and they call this their eight-second definition of health equity, which is health equity means that everyone has a fair opportunity, fair and just opportunity to be as healthy as possible. So fair and just are probably the most important terms in that sentence. And oftentimes, I think I believed for 20 years that this was something I just did naturally by showing up to work every day. You know, and then a lot of this kind of tools and technology started coming out. If you haven't done this, uh, I would encourage you to do this. This is a website you can go to from Robert Wood Johnson, and the URL is there. And you can actually find out, based on your home address or another address, what the life expectancy is for that area. So it's not even by zip code, which is pretty big sometimes. So what I did here was, it says my area, but this is one address at the top, another address right below it, and then you see Tarrant County, which is the county that I work in, Texas, and then the U.S. And this shows you that in one particular address, the top one, the life expectancy is 62 years. The address right below that is just 10 miles away. Life expectancy goes up to 69. Now that's an improvement, but then you keep going down and everyone else's life expectancy as you get into a larger geographic area is 78. Now the easy way to look at this, and adults, adult providers I should say, we're all adults, but the adult providers tend to look at this. And I think a lot of times community people really feel like, well, this is an access to care issue. That the communities where people are dying sooner don't have access to care. And I don't dismiss that that might be a driver. But I want to share uh, what was really a, a painful story for the whole country, but particularly for us in Fort Worth. October of 2019, a woman named Tatiana Jefferson died. 
she was a woman who was in her home and she was shot and killed by a police officer responding to a call that the police department had received. Uh, she was killed in her home and that led to an outpouring that you can imagine in our community. And I was doing this community work uh, really because Cook Children's asked me to and hearing the pain and the reaction in the community on all ends uh, was really eye-opening and painful. What has happened since October of when she passed is that both of her parents have also passed. Now her death, her parents' death, they're all buried in these numbers, right? I'm not sure where they lived exactly, but whenever we run st data like this, statistics like this, we have to remember what's really hidden and buried in these numbers. And I bring up her story for that reason. In healthcare, public health, we've become familiar with this idea of social determinants of health. These are all the ones that are evidence-based. There's a lot more that people talk about and propose, but for every single one of these on this screen, these are what people consider the evidence-based drivers of how long you live, how well you live, how well your uh, influences are on your health habits and your access to care. The citations are ones that you can look at. They're freely available online. And if you work in healthcare, there are evidence-based questions that will elicit the right responses from families you're serving if you want to be able to tackle social determinants, which we should. The other thing though is when you're working with children, it's really hard to stay motivated if I'm thinking, okay, I'm taking care of a two month old a day and I hope 70 years from now they're doing well. Like that's kind of, that's too long for me to know. Uh, because I have practiced pediatrics for a couple decades, I had the aha moment a year ago that a lot of the patients I took care of, if I look back even to medical school, some have passed, you know, the adult patients I took care of have likely passed on. And a lot of the children I took care of are now parenting. And I, this information is where we've landed, right, is looking at adverse child experiences. In our uh, last session, David did a great job of talking about this already. You know, the ones in bold are the evidence-based ones that were tied to the original ACEs study. But there's several others that people have noted that are equally uh, high impact on child health, both in childhood and into adulthood. And you see racism uh, listed there because it is one of the ones that we have known about long before the open conversations of this year. So when I think about life expectancy and I think to myself, well, that's kind of far out, uh, I'm gonna propose today that this is another metric that we have probably overlooked as an entire community. I have no doubt many of you have been looking at this data and have thought about this data and are leading this data effort to improve things. But I would say as a cross system community conversation, this is probably a different idea for a metric. And that is instead of looking at life expectancy, healthcare utilization, what about just looking at the percent of third graders who can read in the state of Texas? Now, because of COVID, we didn't have STAR testing in 2020. So this is the most recent data. So what this shows you is that in 2019, if you look at where it says Texas, 45% of third graders in Texas were reading uh, at third grade level or above. I picked a district, and I will not name what district this is, but I picked a district in Texas. And at this district, out of all the third graders, 34% were reading at third grade level or above. Now, I want you to think about your reaction to these numbers when you hear them. So what was your reaction? Was it nothing because you already knew the data? like it's old news, which is totally fair because it's not necessarily new. Did it make you angry at parents or at teachers? You know, oftentimes star reading rates in Texas become a thing about teachers. 
Uh, are you mad at the students? Like, show up, people. You got to study and read, right? That's an often. I'm a mom of two teenagers, and I do say that on a daily basis. Um, or were you mad at the district? I didn't say what district it was, but it's like, why is this district lower than Texas? We talk a lot about school financing in, in our beautiful state of Texas, um, but you know, Texas is performing higher than this district, but that higher is 45% are on par for third grade reading. What about were you just overwhelmed? I mean, sometimes, especially now with COVID, right? You're just overwhelmed, like, oh, that's like another bad thing I have to deal with. And I really can't, I hope somebody's got that because that's too overwhelming for me and now I'm gonna move on. Or many of you are advocates, that's why you're at this conference, or are you just like ready to help but you're not sure how? Well, I really want us to think about something. So my question for you is this, like why do we talk more about COVID-19 data or the price of gas than when we talk about why so many Texas children can't read well at the end of third grade? I mean, it's never a dinner conversation. It's never a casual conversation, but COVID-19 data is the price of gas. Every time it goes up or down, you know, it's a whole conversation. But the fact that most of our kids in Texas can't read at the end of third grade, can't pass the standard. Uh, they do pass the test, but they can't meet the standard of third grade. Um, it's serious. It's alarming. And it's something that all of us have a collective conscience to think about. Now, I want us to use all of our smarts about ACEs and think about what that means about education. The reason third grade reading matters, right, is because it becomes this potential fork in the road for our kids. So third grade seems to be this benchmark. If you do well in third grade, you have a much better chance of making it through high school and doing well later. If you're not doing well in third grade, you have a much harder time, much higher risk for not making it uh, out of high school. Now, if you think about ACEs, we have long acknowledged now for years that nearly 40% of adults have experienced two or more traumas in their childhood, not as adults in their adult households, but in their own childhood. Now this data has been validated again with a national wide survey that had 200,000 adults in it. So there's no way we can say, well, it was a certain group, it was Southern California, it was just this one zip, it's not. This is 200,000 United States, people, people who live in the United States, who come across all languages, ethnicities, incomes, education levels, household makeup. We can't escape this number. But I want to tie this more specifically in with school performance. So the 200,000 adults, you can look up this um, article, the citation is there for you. But I looked at the numbers more carefully, and here's what it actually shows. Is if you look at the 10 adversities in childhood that were studied in ACEs in the original study, the ones in yellow, if you experienced those in childhood, those adults were more likely to live in poverty today and not have a high school degree. So physical abuse, incarcerated relative, having a mother who was treated violently, having a parent with an addiction, or living in a household with an addiction, or having parents who were divorced, that these specifically in childhood led to adults who were more likely to live in poverty and not have a high school degree. Emotional abuse, which we really don't talk very much about, was the most frequently cited um, form of abuse in these 200,000 adults, 30%. But if you, if you experienced emotional abuse as a child, your likelihood of being unemployed at the time of the study was much higher. So when you look back at the life expectancy disparities, when did that begin? And what were the drivers for that well before those folks hit the age of 60 or didn't? Well, what's the link between adversity and learning? It's kind of intuitive, right? But I wanna make sure that all of you can share this with your family and friends in a way that they can then share it with their family and friends. This is a really important topic that there's some opportunity for us to dive in further. So the idea is that you experience maybe some adversity, trauma, or some serious parent stress 
we heard beautiful reviews of how nothing is more important than this connection between uh, caregiver and baby, caregiver and child, that that's all that matters in this universe is that bond between caregiver and child. But when it's bombarded by stress, if it leads to caregiver neglect, that perception of neglect by that child or baby in the early years can trigger a stressed brain response in the child. And that stressed brain response, chronic, can really respond, can really lead to changes with safety, health, learning, and life potential. And learning has always been buried in this list. Now in Texas and in lots of counties, we have taken trauma-informed care on like it is a new flag. Like it needs a flag, I think, at this point, right? Trauma-informed care is a part of our language in the state of Texas. I'm very proud of that. When you look at health equity through the lens of adversity, science, and trauma-informed care, it's sort of at the end of this train, right? So there's some ACEs that happen, some kind of adversity. It can create this traumatic or toxic stress, and then we provide trauma-informed care. But from an equity lens, is trauma-informed care early enough? We as humans often can only address what we know about. It's in front of us, right? We hear it. We see it, we sense it. There has to be something that tells us in a relationship with a family that something isn't right. But is that really early enough by the time we can recognize that there's a problem? The same survey of 200,000 adults, this is per ACE, the percent of adults that had this childhood abuse or high-risk family situation, right? So out of 20,000 adults, 18% said they were physically abused. They had to remember it too. So keep that in mind. They had to be old enough to remember any of these experiences. Look how high these numbers are. So from an equity lens, are we really able to guess which parent or child is living with an adversity? We do this all the time as a provider. We are left either trying to guess who to ask, or we pray they'll share it with us. We'll hand them a piece of paper or a tool and we'll hope they feel comfortable and engaged and trusting enough to tell us. But if these percentages are higher than you expected, then chances are we're missing most families who are living with something that could be a stressor that affects their child forever. Now, as part of uh, my charge to leave an exam room and go out into the community at Cook Children's, we dove into a particular community. And I'm going to share what we did here so that you can think about doing the same thing. This is really easy to do. This is publicly available data through TEA. So for this one particular district, we picked one pyramid. And we took, in this case, I'm just showing you three elementary schools. And what this is showing you is that while the district had a third grade reading rate of 34% and Texas had a reading rate of 45%. For these three elementary schools, for the first one, they were at 19%, the second was at 25%, and school number three was at 20%. So 20% of all third graders in school number three were reading at a third grade level. Well, what if you took kiddos who just received free and reduced lunch, which was the majority of students in these schools? Well, it goes down a little bit. So now if income is a factor in how you look at student scores, their scores went down. What if you divide by race? Now the majority of students in these schools are African American. Well, one of the schools went up a little bit to 26%. That means one out of four African American third graders in school number two were reading at or above a third grade level. But look at school number three, went down to 9%, 9%. 9 of third graders in school number three were reading at or above a third grade level. What is the likelihood that without any intervention, that would just hope and hugs and prayer that these kids are going to be the children they were born to be and that their parents planned for them to be? And we looked at Hispanic students. It goes up a little bit for school one and three. 
School number three got two stars on there because they exceeded the district, right? So in school number three, Hispanic students exceeded the district average. You know, that's great news, but it's still 39%. And it's not where the whole state of Texas is. So my next question for you is what reaction did you have to these numbers? What questions did you find yourself asking? I will tell you that when I sit at the table with leaders and families and they see this data, it has brought people to tears and has brought other people just wondering, what does that mean? But I think everyone has been struck and this data is just sitting, waiting for us to use it as a community. A couple things that I will frequently hear when we share reading rates is that, well, parents are just disengaged. You know, they've tried, no matter what someone says or does, they just don't care, that the parents just don't care. Or sometimes they're talking about the teachers, that somehow it's a failure of the teachers that only 9% of those students can read at a third grade level. What I really want to suggest, and you heard a little bit of this, or maybe a lot in the last talk, right, is that there's this idea of bias too. And it could be that our reactions may be based on our patterns of thinking. We've all probably heard the words implicit bias or unconscious bias. And in case you haven't, it's the idea that unconsciously we are influenced with information by the way information is processed. So we process information differently because of biases that we have. And that can lead to unintended disparities. So think about how you felt about those numbers and ask yourself, who did you assign responsibility for those numbers? It doesn't make us wrong. It does make us aware of what assumptions we've made about the folks involved with what we think they're responsible for. We've had this wall hanging in our home for a couple of years and I saw it differently this week. It says, don't believe everything you think. That's probably a much simpler way to think about implicit bias. If you think it, pause and ask yourself, what is it based on? One thing about ACEs that makes it so hard is they're so frequent that this is one of those uh, situations where it blurs the lines between us and those we serve. And when those lines are blurred, it can actually make it harder to, to do a great job with families, frankly, because people will say this all the time, like, well, I turned out fine. I mean, sure, I grew up with half of this stuff and I had no problem. You can see what that might do in a relationship with someone that uh, has asked you to serve them, right? that now we have put on them that our ability to turn out X, Y, and Z uh, implies that they should too. Or we do the opposite. And sometimes as compassionate caregivers, we do this <laughs> more readily, which is like, oh no, this is terrible. Like this child has experienced so much, like there's no way things are gonna be okay. You know, or in a very serious note, like that someone says, I personally have experienced these things and it is not gonna be okay. Any time we jump to that, whether it's out of compassion or expectation, either direction, we have sort of disenfranchised that family to just be who they are and experience, as you heard in the last session, um, to be who they are at the time that we're experiencing um, that relationship. So equity requires unbiased engagement, first and foremost. Equity requires, requires unbiased engagement. So these phrases, right? Well, it's their culture. I hear this a lot. Now I've worked with uh, a, you know, clinics that only served families who were African-American. I have worked in clinics that only served folks that were Native American. And I've worked in clinics that have only served or predominantly served families who were not only immigrants from Latin America, but only spoke Spanish. And I heard that things were about their culture in every single one of those settings. You know, people say, well, it's my culture. So I'm Asian American, and I will tell you, I spent years being guilty of this. I would ascribe everything that I grew up with 
as every Asian American's, every Indian American's culture was the same as mine. No joke. I did this for, for decades until I caught myself doing it and uh, realized, uh, yeah, Indian Americans are pretty diverse too. So it's probably just me and my family that I can make assumptions about. You know, the, the most scary one is actually there's no point in talking about it. That does come from caregiver fatigue, helping fatigue, secondary trauma. It becomes a defense almost because the investment of energy, compassion isn't returned. And when it's not returned, we feel sad or mad maybe about it, which is a very human normal response. But in that way, we also say like, there's no point in talking about it because it's not going to matter. And then equally bad, you know, that's how these kids were raised. It's all they know. I mean, to assign an outcome to a category of children is not why any of us are here today. It's not why any of us chose the professions we chose, but it is uh, a potential symptom of the systems we work in. And it's something for you to hear, listen for, and acknowledge, and think about what we can do to tackle that. So we really can bridge science, compassion, and equity for every child if we think about this a little bit differently. Because the real question is this. It's not that all ACEs and social determinants were bad. It's that they affect the child-parent dyad. But to what degree is up to the caregiver? Not actually up to us. It's up to the caregiver. But in it being up to the caregiver, the caregivers are depending on us to support and not interfere or make worse their ability to attune to their child. So you have these high-risk social determinants for ACEs. You got this beautiful nurturing caregiver relationship that's protecting this little one. And the question is, will it trigger chronic HPA access activation and child health issues that affect parenting? Not it will, but will it? So risks hide in many forms. And so I do think that every family deserves the opportunity to know what help is out there, whether they share that need for with us or not. Uh, but when families present, and if we're not going to universally screen, then at least let's not let families in these groups slip through our fingers, right? Every family with an infant is a family with opportunity and risk. Our children with special health care needs. A child who has trauma symptoms, which can look like any symptom can be a trauma symptom. When you have children who are recovering from abuse or neglect, so the populations that should be an automatic flag for us, if you hear a child is in foster care, if a child is living with kin, or if a child's been adopted. So those are indicators like, oh, I wonder what happened in the original birth family system for this child. And it could be, oftentimes, especially with foster care and kinship and domestic adoptions, that this child is recovering from abuse or neglect of some form, and that that doesn't just go away because they moved homes, right? They changed addresses. They didn't change the script that is written uh, into their lives. When we have caregivers with an untreated mental illness, intimate partner violence, or substance use disorder, this is especially a call out to those of you who serve adults, or if you have friends who serve adults. Our adult healthcare providers are probably the first gate to that adult client's children being identified as a child who's lived with adversity that may affect their trajectory. So every time we have a caregiver reaching out for help, let's make sure the caregiver has the opportunity to be a spectacular parent to the children they've been raising through these really tough experiences. There's also just high risks to social determinants of health. If someone is struggling with food or housing insecurity, I mean, great, we, they need a place to sleep first and foremost. Everyone needs a tummy that is not hungry, absolutely. But let's not stop there. Let's remember that if your family's in those situations, it's a flag for other risks that may have led to this point that they can receive uh, support and services for. I'm going to focus on three of these groups. The last session was so good about parents and infants. I'm just going to read this one thing to remind us of the cycle, right? So secure attachment is critical for emotional regulation. 
but the absence of it not only can trigger a lifetime of anxiety, depression, or school problems. This is beginning in infancy, right? We're still talking about the infant relationship. The worst part of this is that it can worsen the parent's sense of worthlessness, rejection, and depression. This reminds you how badly parents want to be their best parents. They want to be their best every day. Not every day is going to be great. I can absolutely guarantee that as a mom. But when most of it is bad, it's really hard to feel any sense of worth. And when parents don't feel a sense of worth, how empowered do they feel to protect their baby's brain development or do the things that you're recommending uh, will help them be their best parent? Social determinants. I mentioned housing. This is a really important study. It's possible I talked about this study to you before, but here I go again. These researchers surveyed 22,000 people, and what they found is that they lumped together families who were either behind on rent, had multiple moves, or were homeless, and then they compared certain outcomes for them for those who had stable housing. And what I did when I looked at the data was I combined behind on rent, multiple moves, and homelessness. And you'll see here that the numbers aren't that different. So being behind on rent was as risky to a caregiver for experiencing depression as being homeless, right? They were two to almost four times more likely to have depression compared to those with stable housing. So whether you're behind on rent, moved a lot, or were homeless, you were almost four times more likely to experience depression compared to someone with stable housing. How about food insecurity? Four to five times more likely to experience food insecurity if you were either behind on rent, moved frequently, or were homeless. I will tell you right now, I never asked families in the 20 years of seeing children if they were behind on rent, never crossed my mind. I could tell you who was living in a shelter or living at their friend's house. During COVID-19, I know we had a grace period there where families were protected uh, from being evicted, but we're gonna have to be really thoughtful about seeking this information out as we help families thoughtfully and in a relevant way uh, and ask about being behind on rent. How about the child foregoing health care? Children f skipped health care two to three more times more likely than if they had stable housing. Now, when you think about it like, well, they had how cold and it didn't really matter, it actually does matter because one in five U.S. children has a special health care need. And if children go without their health care when they have a special health care need, what does it do? It stresses the caregivers out more because that health condition is still showing up at home. They still have to manage uh, what's happening there. And if you look at this, it's they were two times more likely to have childhood adversities and four times more likely to have a parent in poor health. We have a lot of different programs that serve children with special health care needs. And many of them already do a good job with this. But let's make sure all of us are asking about parents' health status and adversity for our kids who are living with special health care needs. The other concerning thing is that Children who identified as black and non overrepresented in our population of children who have special health care needs. And we have to really think about whether that's uh, necessary or not. If it was all a condition specific to African American children, that might be fine. But that's highly doubtful that that's what's driving the disparity. Childhood trauma symptoms show up in all kinds of ways. You know, the way babies look, toddlers look, pre-K or school-age children look, and high school students look is really different. So for our babies who have trauma symptoms, it might be that they're more fussy, they're the kiddo who gets labeled as colic, they have feeding issues, sleep problems, injuries, because maybe there's intimate partner abuse and they got knocked out of someone's arms during a fight. These are things that really do happen. Um, loose stools because their GI tract is just so, sorry, their, their gastrointestinal tract is kind of revved up from stress just like we can get right before we're really stressed, um, or they have developmental delays. And our toddlers, developmental delays, again, acting out, that kiddo whose head banging won't quiet down, it's just really stressed. 
not sleeping. Are we really going to fix sleep um, through a lot of sleep hygiene if the underpinning is trauma? Probably not. And they're more sick. Pre-K and school age become more concerning because these kiddos become more disruptive in a classroom environment. So we become much more attuned <laughs> to kids as they begin interfering with our own um, atmospheres, right? Like in group settings. So behavior issues, toileting, this is when learning problems start to emerge. If we always thought of a learning problem or a developmental delay as a potential red flag for families struggling at home, it would be a transformative early intervention opportunity than us simply referring out and following up in high school. When we think about our kiddos who are risk-taking, oh my gosh, so high school students are so annoying sometimes, right? But what's really happening is they're responding to stress. And we have an opportunity to really think about how do we reinterpret their behaviors as an unaddressed trauma. We missed infancy, toddlerhood, and school age. It's never too late to connect with somebody in high school and realize that what they've been wanting lifelong is someone to listen and understand and help them heal from trauma before they fail high school. For my pediatrician friends out there, or if you have friends who are in pediatrics, have them read this uh, policy statement. It's old, 10 years old, and it talks about the fact that we can decrease child health disparities through the implementation of the principles and practice of child health equity. These are the list of, a sample list of conditions, really, that I would ask we don't forget about uh, when we're serving children and families. If we see any of these, it's an opportunity to pause and think about adversity and trauma and what we haven't done. So to relook at this a little bit differently, right? It's the caregiver who calms a child's neuroendocrine stress response, not us. Our role is right here. Let's make sure to intensively support nurturing protective caregivers and not somehow undermine or interrupt this beautiful relationship that's necessary for lifelong health. I'm going to skip this. I know you all have had a great task force happening here in San Antonio. Uh, we did a similar thing in Tarrant County and called it our circles of support. I would really have uh, you continue open dialogue across systems to find actionable steps during COVID-19 school disruption and pre-K disruption. And I would really want to just highlight one of these, which is implicit bias training. It's not a, you, you know, a module you take online, but there's got to be an opportunity right now. It's a little bit safer, frankly, on Zoom to have open dialogue around what bias looks like, feels like, and spot it more quickly. So now when you look at this reading rate, right, 34% for one district and 45% for the state of Texas, it's not really teachers or district officials or just school financing, right, it's that we need to engage. And there's a way to really tackle this. I believe that. Hope is everywhere. It starts with y'all, but I have to share this with you. School is a building which has four walls with tomorrow inside. And this was on my fortune cookie. I appreciate y'all being here. Stay safe and connected. And I look forward to taking any questions you have. Okay, um, we're we're right towards the very end of this, and um, there are some fabulous questions. Um, I think perhaps we can take one question, and um, which uh, has gotten a lot of votes from a lot of people, and is is the best question. And and um, I want everybody to know that um, that. Uh, she can come back in later and fill these questions out because the Q&A in this section um, stays with the video. Okay, so here is one question. How do you think COVID is going to affect our children's education going forward? I know teachers are stressed out due to virtual learning. I even recall hearing that some teachers were just trying to finish the year out, passing children on to the next grade. Those who may not have been ready, parents are struggling to teach their children at home as well. Yeah, so in 30 seconds. <laughs> I have a 13-year-old, a 15-year-old, and I have been super worried about all students. And the thing is, uh, what happens to students is really what happens to our children. So every person who is 
raising a child and is sending them either out the door or to a computer is in the position to protect their education. I, I personally, this is just me personally saying this, I don't think we can expect our districts to manage a pandemic and protect the educational outcomes of every student without it being an absolute partnership with parents. And we have to, as caregivers, pick up what we can at home, as stressful as that is for us. Ultimately, when our kids are 18 or 20, they're not gonna blame the pandemic for what happens. They're gonna look to us and we're gonna be right there by their side. Um, so that I hope answers that question. I do have hope that they'll be okay, but only with really intentional partnership and for us to pick it up at home. Thank you so very much. And as I said, um, if you come back to this video later, um, we'll be able to an put the answers to some of those questions in the video. You got it. So sorry okay. to go over. Thank you all for the opportunity. Have a great Thank you. afternoon. Okay. Hi, I'm Kathy Fletcher, and welcome to Voices for Children of San Antonio. Voices for Children's mission expands our community's capacity to respond to current and emerging needs of children through purposeful and strategic advocacy that improves programs, practices, and policy. Our vision is to open windows of opportunity to engage and energize the community so that every child moves every day toward a bright tomorrow. As an early childhood consultant, I serve on the board of voices to support those in celebrating